Welcome back, everybody, to part two of our look at Epic History TV's video on HMS Victory. So, um, just as always, a couple of things before we start. Please leave a like and some comments if you like what I do here. Um, there's reaction videos every Wednesday and Friday. Um, Monday has kind of become a day for specials, so if, I've, if there's any videos um, that I want to react to that have you know, um, that I can't fit into the schedule sooner. They'll come out on Monday, like the Ukraine videos. If I've also got original content, they'll come out on Mondays too, so please keep your eyes peeled. I've d I have actually got some ideas um, in the pipeline for more original content now as well, so I'm trying to keep those videos kind of short and sweet, because they tend to do really well, so um, please keep your eyes peeled for that too. Um, but, um, so yeah, let's just dive straight back in. So please check out part one and as always there's a link to Epic History TV and the original video in the description too so please check that out as well and show them some love because they've put a lot of work into this um, from what I've seen in part in the first part of our reaction so um, but yeah so let's just dive straight back in. So this is Epic History TV um, HMS Victory. A Napoleonic ship of the line was in essence a giant floating gun battery designed to pulverize enemy warships and shore installations. Victory's three largest decks were all about her guns, as indicated by their name, the upper, middle, and lower gun deck. <laughs> the upper gun deck housed 30 12-pounder guns, 15 on each side. Forward in the roundhouses was the head for junior officers, rank bringing slightly more privacy and comfort. The sick bay was located in the forward area of the upper gun deck, as it got more fresh air and sunlight than the lower decks. It was screened off from the rest of the deck by canvas partitions. The surgeon's assistants, nicknamed Lob Lolly Boys for the soup they fed to patients, also slept here in their hammocks. HMS Victory was a first-rate ship of the line, defined as one that carried 100 guns or more. They were the most powerful mm. vessel... So I got that wrong in part one, because I said a first-rate, I think, was about 80 guns or more. That's probably a second-rate. Um, but like I said, other navies use different, slightly different rating systems, so I may, may have been even thinking of another one, I don't know. But just a, correct, a slight correction there. ...walls afloat, and so admirals often chose them as their flagships the command vessels for a fleet or squadron. Several renowned British admirals took victory as their flagship at various times, including Earl Howe and Earl St Vincent. The most famous, of course, was Viscount Nelson. An admiral required his own suitably grand quarters, located in the stern section of the upper gun deck. These comprised an anteroom, and a dining room, which also served as a meeting room. In the sleeping cabin, the Admiral usually slept in a suspended cot. But Nelson preferred a campaign bed like this one, easier to get in and out of with only one arm. At the very stern lay the... Yeah, because uh, as well as people aren't familiar, Nelson uh, famously lost his arm in battle. I believe that was at the Battle of the Nile, I think. Um, it had to be amputated. Um, but one thing that I'm sure we may get into, especially perhaps in part two, because obviously this is just part one of the guide, is Nelson pretty much had a death where she was just obsessed with dying in battle. And there were several times, including when he had his arm amputated, that he was convinced he was going to die. Um, I don't know, maybe he was just being a typical man. You know how we get when we get a cold man flu. The Admiral's day cabin which served as his office and private space. The Admiral would spend much of his day here, submerged in the meetings, paperwork and administration required in the running of a fleet. The Admiral's cabins, like all cabins on the gun decks and quarter deck, were formed by removable wooden panels. This meant when a ship cleared for action before battle, the cabins could be rapidly dismantled and carried, with furniture and personal items, down into the hold. The purpose of this was to allow the gun crews to work their guns without obstruction. The middle gun deck housed 28 24-pounder guns. Heavier guns were lower in the ship, 
for greater stability. The ship's galley, a kitchen and giant iron stove, was where the ship's cook and his mates prepared meals for the crew. And I can imagine that was probably a nerve-wracking job, considering I know it's encased in iron, but you've still got essentially an open flame on a wooden ship. So, yeah, I'd be pretty nervous working in there. The stern section was known as the wardroom, where commissioned officers dined and slept. At night, around 300 sailors and marines slept on this deck, their hammocks strung up between the guns. The deck below was the lower gun deck. This housed the Victory's heaviest guns, her 30 32 pounders. And at night, more than half the crew, around 460 men, slept here. So some people might be looking at this and thinking, well, what happens if there was a, you know, if there was a surprise attack at night? Well, it's difficult to surprise anything in the age of sail, for one, because the ships are just so slow. So as long as you had alert lookouts at night, it was very, very difficult to get the jump on a ship. You know, when a ship was sighted, you might have, you know, anywhere from, say, half an hour to a couple of hours to prepare. So, you know, you could be caught off guard, but you'd still have plenty of time to clear the decks, you know, and get ready for get ready for combat. So um, difficult to surprise anything. Um, the only time that you could really ever get the drop on an enemy is if there was fog. And if you, especially if you knew where the enemy was and they didn't know where you were, that was probably the only time that you could surprise an enemy. And as well, just purely for the fact that they were difficult to coordinate, battles were rarely fought at night anyway. You know, even land battles, you know, they were rarely fought in the night. Um, there were exceptions, you know, um, the Battle of Cape St. Vincent, at least one of them, uh, um, because there were several battles fought in Cape St. Vincent, one of them during the American Revolution and one of them during the French Revolutionary Wars. I believe it was the one fought in the American Revolution that was actually fought at night against the Spanish fleet, and it actually uh, gained the uh, name, uh, the nickname of Moonlight Battle for that reason, um, because it was very rare in the Age of Sail to have a battle fought at night. This plan of HMS Bedford, a contemporary third-rate ship of the line, shows how crowded it could be below decks. Wow. This far down in the ship, gun ports were usually kept shut because they were close to the waterline. With little fresh air and so many men living down here. Just a quick note as well, I think that's actually one of the main theories on how the Mary Rose sank. Um, Mary Rose was much, much earlier than this ship. Um, that ship was the pride and joy of Henry VIII's uh, fleet. And it famously sank um, with all hands. Um, and has since become um, a fascination for divers because it's extraordinarily well preserved considering, you know, all things considered. Um, we've actually gained a lot of knowledge from the wreck of the Mary Rose. Um, but there's actually theories that the Mary Rose was so heavily laden down and it had its lower gun ports open that when it turned, um, it was so low in the water that it turned and the gun ports it essentially just flooded and it just sank. So. Yeah, gun, you know, gun ports were usually kept shut on these lower decks. The smells of the lower gun deck could be notoriously challenging. The stern area, separated by canvas screens, was known as the gun room. This was where warrant officers dined, with screened off sleeping quarters for the master gunner, chaplain, and two junior lieutenants. They shared the gun room with the ship's tiller, a large wooden beam connecting the ship's rudder to the ship's wheel via a series of ropes and pulleys. The tiller is not currently in situ, but the strip of canvas marks its position. The beam would swing through the room when the ship turned, so anyone dining in the gun room was wise to mind their head. Below the lower gun deck was the Orlop deck a warren of small cabins and stores beneath the waterline, lit only by lanterns. The forward section contained storerooms and cabins for the bosun and carpenter. The more open area by the main mast was known as the cockpit. 
I think boatswain as well is sometimes spelled as if it looks like boat swain. You know, it's spelled like B O A T S W A I N, um, but it's always pronounced boatswain. Um, so, just a small note there. Fore and aft, the midshipman berthed and messed here, but in battle it became the surgeon's operating theatre. At the Battle of Trafalgar, after Vice Admiral Nelson was shot on the quarter deck by a French sharpshooter, he was carried down to the Orlop. Victory's surgeon was unable to save him, and this is where he died. Off the aft cockpit lay a series of cramped compartments, including personal storerooms for the captain and first lieutenant, the steward's room for issuing rations brought up from the hold, the surgeon's cabin and his dispensary, and various other cabins and storerooms. Forward and aft, hanging magazines held ready-made cartridges for the guns sent up from the main magazine. The Orlop deck was surrounded by a passage known as the Carpenter's Walk, which gave the carpenter and his mates easy access to the ship's hull to plug any leaks. At the very bottom of the ship lay the hold, around 50,000 cubic feet, holding provisions for up to six months at sea. It was lined with 257 tons of iron ballast to keep the ship stable. This was covered by 200 tons of shingle, additional ballast, which provided a stable bed for the ship's 150 gallon water casks. These alone weighed roughly 300 tons at the start of a voyage. Wow. Other barrels contained 50 tons of salt beef, 50 tons of salt pork, and 45 tons <laughs> of ship's biscuit. So I'm just laughing at ship's biscuit because that stuff isn't was notorious in its time. If anyone's familiar with uh, history cooking channels, there's two fantastic ones that I can't recommend enough. One is Tasting History with Max Miller, just fantastic show. Um, and Townsend's, Townsend's is kind of like the OG his, uh history cooking site um if anyone's fa if anyone's familiar with it you'll know of the nutmeg memes uh, that it's that channel um they've both done videos on ship's biscuit and um biscuit actually just means twice twice baked um so um in britain in the modern day biscuit is usually what americans would call a cookie you know um but biscuit is generally referring to Essentially, they were essentially like unleavened bread that was just baked twice. And it was baked twice to get all the moisture driven off, so it would preserve it for longer. But because of that, they were extremely hard. You know, there is no way, for example, you could put one of these things in your mouth and just eat it. You would crack your teeth. And because of that, they actually gained the nickname of molar crackers because they, they could crack your molar. They were that hard. Um, there were some. They were often became infested with uh, weevils and worms, so they were sometimes called worm castles <laughs> as well as a nickname. Um, but um, they were often just like dunked in uh, water or coffee to soften them as a way to just to make them palatable, or they could be ground like reground into essentially what was essentially a, f a new flour and they would use that to thicken stews and soups and things like that. Uh, so that's how they ate those. Um, but yeah, so food, food supplies on ships like this um, were notorious for being bad. They were, off, they were often spoiled. Um, they would often go rancid quite easily as well, which is why beef and pork and meat and things like that were heavily salted. And um, salt pork especially, um, you couldn't eat it raw you know you had to soak it in water first or some kind of liquid just to wash the ex excess uh, salt off because it was just unbearably salty otherwise um but yeah so ships had to put into port quite regularly because food supplies would just often go rancid so um at the time as well because the food supplies were so bad um there wasn't a lot of variation in the diet there's um a distinct lack of fresh fruit and vegetables just because they spoil um which is why you get scurvy and things like that which is just an abs a deficiency in certain vitamins usually vitamin c um and that was actually um 
a cure for that was discovered actually as early as I think it was like the early 1500s um, there was a, an expedition of four ships and uh, three of the ships ended up with scurvy outbreaks on board one of them didn't the only difference was that the one ship that didn't served um, lemon juice every morning so they reported these findings to the Admiralty who then promptly ignored it for the next two three hundred years um, and it wasn't until I think it was around this time actually that they started to introduce um, lemons, lemon juice, into the Royal Navy. And I think it was because at one point they ran out of lemons and they had to get limes. Or it might have been that just limes was just how they referred to both lemons and limes at the time. I can't remember which one it is. Um, but that's why Brits today have the nickname of limey, um, because they served uh, lemon juice and lime juice to ward off scurvy and they would just mix it with water and just drink it, so. Various storerooms below contained items such as flour, spirits, tar, and paint. Mm. The shop flour especially would go rancid pretty quickly. Um, it, it could often go moldy, for example, um, or it would just be infested with uh, parasites of some kind. So that's why you generally had biscuit instead. It was just baked into biscuits, and that would be done on shore, you know, um, biscuit making. Um, it was just essentially just a way to preserve flour, basically. And it's kind of interesting when you look at the history of food in general. Most foods that we have just exist as a way to preserve things. Alcohol is a way to preserve, you know, barley or rye or grapes and things like that. Uh, cheese is a way to preserve milk, you know. Bread is a way to preserve wheat and flour. So, you know, it's just one of those fascinating asides. Hot locker contained 100 tons of iron shot. Last but not least, the most vulnerable part of the ship, the Grand Magazine, holding up to 35 tons of gunpowder in 784 barrels. A fire here would cause an explosion that obliterated the ship and anyone aboard. Or if so there's actually a famous example of that happening um, at the Battle of the Nile, uh, which is one of the battles that Nelson was in command at. Um, so just context for the time, Napoleon had launched invasion of Egypt, um, hoping to sort of get through and cut off the British uh, link with India. India was basically the, um, the money machine of the British Empire, essentially. Um, and the British fleet defeated the French fleet um, in the Battle of the Nile and ended Napoleon's ambitions there. So um, the French flagship there, Lorient, uh, Lorient, I think is how you pronounce it. It's like the Orient, uh, Lorient, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, it. It caught fire in the middle of the battle and the fire spread to the powder magazine and they couldn't put the fire out. It was just raging, this inferno. And the ship eventually just blew up. And there's, there's famous paintings of it. I'll put one on screen, actually. Um, there's fam famous painting of the ship blowing up. But the explosion was just so massive that it actually, the seams of the inside of the ship, so the, the wooden hull of a ship was held together by seams, which was just these metal bands that were held together by essentially like metal pins and rivets and things like that. Um, the explosion was so powerful that it burst the seams on some of the other ships in the battle. And, you know, it was just this huge fireball that could be seen from, you know, miles away on land even. And it was just so huge and stunning that the fighting actually stopped for a few minutes. And um, both sides actually tried to uh, essentially there was like this ceasefire, almost this informal ceasefire, as they tried to pick up survivors from the explosion, both sides. Um, but the explosion was just so big that it just stunned everyone into silence. And so that's just an example of how big these explosions could be. Water got in, the gunpowder would be useless in battle. Therefore, elaborate precautions were taken to keep the magazine safe, including fire doors, fire retardant plaster walls, copper sheathing to avoid sparks and keep out moisture and rats. The forward section of the magazine was the filling room. Here, loose gunpowder was scooped from this powder bin into cloth bags to make cartridges for the guns. Lanterns were kept safely behind glass in an adjacent light room. Until required, ready cartridges were stored in racks 
on either side of the filling room. In an age before steam or electrical power, all the ship's heavy lifting had to be done by manpower. Mechanical assistance came from two capstans, the main capstan and gear capstan. These were effectively giant winches, which extended vertically through the middle and lower gun decks. To turn them, bars were inserted into the capstan head, with up to 10 men pushing each bar. Using both decks, this meant 260 men were working the capstan for the heaviest jobs, such as raising the main anchor or hoisting a gun. The work was often accompanied by a fiddler, a shanty, and the stamp of feet. Victory carried seven anchors in total. The heaviest, the best bower anchor, weighed four tons and was rigged at the starboard bow. The small bower anchor on the larboard side was only slightly smaller. Sheet, kedge and stream anchors served as spares and for keeping the ship stationary in small harbours or rough weather. All wooden ships leak at sea, even before hulls are split by cannonballs or hidden reefs. Vi even all modern ships leak at sea as well. It just, it's just one of those things that just happens. Victory had four crank-operated chain pumps, which could pump water out of the ship at approximately 1,300 gallons per minute, about 300 jerry cans worth. She also had two elm pumps, for pumping seawater into the ship, for washing and putting out fires. In the late 18th century, HMS Victory and ships like her were the most sophisticated and advanced machines in the world. Massive floating batteries that could remain at sea for six months or more and traverse the globe. In the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, they battled for naval supremacy, most dramatically in giant fleet actions. It was a contest that Britain won decisively. The consequences for Napoleon were disastrous. But for all victory's qualities, it was not ship design that gave Britain the edge in the war at sea. It was the men who sailed her. British commanders and crews were experienced, capable and aggressive. In the next video, we'll see how they sailed and fought a ship like Victory, and how they lived aboard her. Oh, looks like we've got another little bit here. Our deep thanks to the National Museum of the Royal Navy and HMS Victory for their help in making this series. Victory is now embarking on an exciting new phase of her long and dramatic history. A major 10-year conservation project to ensure her survival far into the future. The work is guided by the latest scientific and historical research and will involve removing and replacing rotting timber and other structural repairs. And the great news is that the ship remains fully open to visitors throughout. Visit during the project and you'll even get to see conservation work up close, with expert shipwrights on hand to explain what's happening. For more information and bookings, please visit historicdockyard.co.uk. Interesting. Uh, so yeah, another fantastic uh, part of the video there. So let me know what you think in the comments. That was an extremely well put together um, piece of history there. So. Um, I'm looking forward to diving into part two um, as soon as it becomes available. I don't know if it's already up or not. If it is, we'll just go straight into that. But um, if not, I can't wait to see it. Um, but yeah, so let me know what you think in the comments. And in the meantime, thank you all so much for watching, and I shall see you all on the next one.